Okay, our next talk will be by Dr. Jane Burns, who was introduced yesterday, so I'll just briefly introduce her again. Um, she's going to be presenting on the closing of another driving biological project that was within the first three years of IDASH um, called Molecular Phenotyping of Kawasaki Disease, and she also present a little bit on some whole genome sequencing work. Thank you, Michelle. So uh, I'm back to tell you about some projects, uh, some data that you've already heard about in previous presentations uh, in this uh, type of form format or forum, and uh, also about some new data that although it was one of the specific aims of our DBP, we only got the data two weeks ago. Uh, so uh, we're very happy that that happened, finally, uh, and I will be able to share those data with you today. So we had three basic specific aims for our DBP that was part of the first three years of the IDASH grant. The first was small RNA sequencing. No one had looked at microRNAs, no one had looked at link RNAs or any of the other non-coding RNAs in Kawasaki disease. And we thought this was a great opportunity to be able to partner with IDASH and specifically with Jihoon Kim, who wanted to create some tools which were needed by the general microbiology, biologic community for analyzing small RNA species. So that was a great opportunity where we wanted to do the science and he wanted to develop the pipeline. So that worked out very well and that was published in PLOS One. Uh, earlier this year. The DNA sequencing targeting hotspots that had been identified through GWAS family linkage studies and, and other means association studies in the large Kawasaki disease cohort at Sing in Singapore in collaboration with the international group was an effort to try to find rare variants that might explain these clusters of significant intronic SNPs that seem to impact both disease outcome as well as susceptibility, and we wanted to understand that better. And those are the data that we just received two weeks ago due to uh, technical issues that targeted sequencing, although it seems very easy. I mean, if we can do whole genome sequencing, why can't we do small targeted sequencing? Turns out actually to be technically challenging and took three years to get that done. And the last specific aim that's listed here, but the one I'm going to speak about first and, and then we can move on, was creating the Kawasaki Disease Warehouse. And this was done by Aziz Bakswala and Shawnee Kim, who you heard from yesterday, and, and others in the IDASH team, and really formed the basis for so much of the work that we've been able to do over the past three years because we really needed this data management system. And, and although that sounds maybe not as exotic as figuring out, you know, bridging deletions and things like that that's much more exotic, um, you know, we're the, we're the boots on the ground people. We're, we're the end users. And we really, really needed that system to work well, to be efficient. And uh, it really all began with that. So Basically, all of the papers that we've published in the last three years cite the IDASH grant because they were all done using this data warehouse, and, and we really didn't have a practical way to do that until we were given this tool. So again, not, not as sexy as the other tools you've been hearing about, but from a boots on the ground point of view, very, very important and, and very, very helpful to the work that we do. So this is just a screenshot uh, from one of the uh, uh, pages and what we're doing now in the spirit of IDASH, being able to create tools and be able to share, we are setting up, as I talked about yesterday, a portal into this same database management system for the folks in Atlanta with whom we're collaborating in DBP4. And we've had a fellow in the lab for the last three years who's been extensively using the REDCap management system for his research. He's now returned to Kitasato University in Japan, where he's from. And we discussed and, and are now going to implement a portal whereby they're actually going to 
in input in English uh, because uh, most of the physicians there uh, can speak in English an enough to be able to enter data into the data set, uh, into the, the case report forms in English. And they're going to be doing this uh, in Japan where although obviously they have very sophisticated uh, computing, the clinicians again, the, the people on the front lines doing, doing this kind of clinical research actually don't have tools other than Excel spreadsheets for managing their data. So this is gonna create a portal with them and, and we're really pleased about that and I have fantasies of getting all of Japan Kawasaki disease researchers into portals that we could all share and do collaborative research and make the world a better place. So, Moving on now to the other specific aim about small RNA sequencing. This is published data, so I'm going to go through it rather rapidly, uh, but we learned some very important uh, lessons that we'd like to follow up with some biologic projects. We started with a small sample, sample number, uh, 12 Kawasaki disease individuals and six adenovirus control children. And the idea was that we were going to do small RNA sequencing with a discovery uh, objective. So creating the pipeline was Jihoon Kim's uh, goal, and he's going to talk to you about MAGI, which he created uh, in response to the need to analyze all the sequence data. And so Jihoon's going to speak after me. I'm not going to say anything more about it because I don't understand it. Um, but uh, what, <laughs> what he was able to do with the sequences that were generated was to basically put them through the MAGI pipeline, and this is just a flow diagram of how we got to the part that we were interested in, which was uh, aligning the sequences that were generated to the database. And as I said, we, so first of all, the MIR my, or microRNA databases are still evolving. People are, are obviously discovering new MIRs every day and adding to the databases. And we thought that we were going to find perhaps novel mirrors, and, and that was part of the motivation. Um, that wasn't, in fact, what we found among the top 10 differentially expressed mirrors. So we had the uh, mirror sequences from both acute whole blood samples as well as convalescent. This shows the hierarchy uh, of the uh, mirrors that we found in terms of the top 10 differentially expressed mirrors. And the ones that were of particular interest to us were uh, MIR 143 and 145, which are actually enc uh, encoded for uh, tandemly on the same chromosome. And there's a, a lot of interest in the cardiovascular disease field. And of course, Kawasaki disease is a cardiovascular disease. I mentioned that we also used adenovirus infected children, their whole blood as a type of control group. It turns out that adenovirus is the most frequently mistaken for Kawasaki disease among the infections and rash fever illnesses in childhood. So we thought it was an interesting comparator, and of course there were some very significantly differentially expressed uh, mirrors, and we've had a graduate student who has gone on to uh, do some work, and some publications will be coming from her analysis of adenovirus microRNAs and uh, what they may be doing during the acute infection in these children. And again, there's uh, MIR-145 down there, differentially expressed between these. Chisato Shimizu in our group, who, who has really done all the molecular biology associated with uh, these studies, went on to do a RT-PCR validation on whole blood RNA from uh, an additional cohort of subjects, including both Kawasaki disease as well as adenovirus subjects. And you can see that, again, there was a significant differential expression uh, of MIR-145 in this group. And this is just a summary slide to talk about other published data that talks about uh, MIR-143, 145 having interesting targets in genes uh, being expressed in vascular smooth muscle cells, aorta, and coronary arteries, all targets that are of uh, great interest to us with the biology of our disease. Chisato then went on to think about what these mirrors might be doing in terms of regulation and got into the area of extracellular particles. So uh, just in the same way that the genome 
understanding has evolved and we used to think that everything that was in between genes was garbage and obviously now we know it's incredibly important. People used to think that all that little schmutz floating around in your blood that wasn't actually within a cell uh, was garbage and little blebs popping off from cells that were uninteresting. And it turns out that no, we were all wrong, of course. And there's a very directed, very specific, and very important signaling mechanism going on from cell to cell that is using little particles, microparticles in the circulation to send messages uh, and communicate between cells. And part of the way that they communicate is by sending microRNAs between cells that have specific targets where they're going to change the transcriptional profile of the target cell. And this has been uh, worked out by others. And so Chisada went about uh, isolating microparticles from the uh, plasma of our Kawasaki disease patients. And here's an electron uh, micrograph of that that was done in collaboration with Clark Chen at the Cancer Center here. And Chisato worked with their group to, to do this and then was able to do a, a size uh, experiment looking at uh, what uh, size these particles were on average and then actually isolating the RNA and showing that, yes, indeed, the Kawasaki particles were, in fact, uh, carrying MIR-145. And again, this is all uh, published in PLOS One. Uh, and, and made a, a really wonderful story. And this is the, the final slide about why this is of such biologic interest to us, the TGF beta pathway uh, we have talked about and, and written about. Again, this is really all Chisato's work. Uh, how important the TGF beta pathway is in aneurysm formation. And I've spoken about that in previous uh, talks, but it turns out that at least it is predicted by the various algorithms that are out there that MIR-145 targets a number of the transcripts of genes in the TGF beta pathway, and the next biologic project for us would be to go ahead and, and validate that these targets are true. These are based on computer uh, predictions of what the targets for the microRNA are. Um, so we'd like to find out if that's really true and then come to a, a better biologic understanding of what MIR-145 might be doing to modulate the TGF beta signaling pathway in our disease. So moving on to the last specific aim where we were going to resequence target genes, we had these hotspots, which I'm going to show you in the next slide, and we basically could afford <laughs> to do 96 Kawasaki disease cases, um, and 96 controls. These were self-declared Caucasians, and they were enriched for subjects who had the bad cardiovascular outcome of Kawasaki disease, which are aneurysms in the coronary arteries. And the reason, the motivation for doing this was that based on our association studies and GWAS studies that we had done as part of the International uh, Kawasaki Disease Genetics Consortium, we had found these hot spots. And it was of interest to us that all of the hot spots were in, uh, were in intronic regions. And I don't know how to get this to work. All right, so you can see the intronic regions there. And uh, these SNPs were clustered. So these are s significant SNPs. Uh, the top group that are all in TGF beta pathway-related genes were published in Chisato's uh, uh, Circulation Cardiovascular Genetics paper. And then we had another pathway, a calcium signaling pathway, that we also think is very important in KD pathogenesis. Uh, so PCLG2 is um, one of the genes in that calcium signaling pathway. And then from a family linkage study that we've done, we have one of these nucleoside transporter genes, ABCC4, at the bottom that also had some clustered SNPs. So these were our candidates where we wanted to go in, and the underlined regions that you see there are the areas that were targeted for uh, sequencing in this cohort of uh, almost 100 Kawasaki disease and control subjects. This is the list that uh, Chisato called from uh, the results of the significant SNPs that were different between the cases and the controls. 
And rather than, you can see that they were found in TGF beta receptor 2, SMAD3 also in that pathway, and then the calcium signaling pathway gene. But I just want to show you something that uh, is curious. I'm, I'm not sure we have a complete understanding of this, but I think it's important and I think it's real. <laughs> and here's what we found. We didn't recapitulate the SNPs that had actually been found in the initial discovery uh, genotyping studies, but we found SNPs that were intercalated in between them. Some of them were actually novel SNPs that didn't have RS numbers. Others were, were ones that had been described. So this is a very small cohort. If you're jumping in to do case control with roughly 100 subjects in each group, that's a, that's a tiny group. And we could have very easily come up empty-handed and, and found nothing by resequencing. But what we found were SNPs that were in between the SNPs that we were interested in. We didn't find the smoking gun rare variant uh, that explained everything uh, with a huge p-value, but we found these highly significant SNPs, again, clustered in between the other SNPs that we already knew about. So we need to understand what these introns are doing. None of the introns are encoding for an obvious mirror that it, we found to be important in this disease. These, coding re, these non coding regions are doing something very important, and they are involved in the pathogenesis of this disease. And we're just not far enough along with the biology of what these introns are doing to understand why this is significant. But I'm convinced that it is, and of course we have to prove that experimentally by going on and then validating these SNPs in independent cohorts to see that they, they hold up on further scrutiny. I'm going to speak just for a moment about something that's actually consumed a huge amount of time by our, our mini IDASH team, which is uh, Chisato, Jihoon, and myself, and that is the whole genome sequencing. So we've been talking about privacy um, endlessly for the last two days, and so this is very unprivate. Um, this is being shown with the, the blessing and the uh, encouragement, actually, of this family. So we talked about altruism, why people participate in research. And this uh, family, African-American family, um, of whom there are two Kawasaki disease patients here, the uh, baby being held by our study nurse and uh, the child that mom is holding there in the photograph are both affected. And then there are uh, two unaffected siblings, one of whom is shown here. But this family really wanted to uh, publicly let everybody know that they were doing this because they felt everybody should step forward and contribute their DNA for, for uh, research. And, and so I am totally showing this with their permission and their encouragement. So this is really Jihoon's work, and I'm not exactly sure why I'm standing up here talking about it, but <laughs> you all know that Jihoon did this work. Um, we had really to start at the beginning because for a complex genetic disease, no one had really published a roadmap, created the tools, developed a pipeline, or really given very much public thought to how you would approach the analysis of a family with complex genetic disease in two of the affected individuals. And so we really uh, started from scratch. Uh, we got from Illumina, so that th this opportunity became available because Illumina, uh, Jay Flatley specifically, volunteered and offered to do the sequencing on this family. And, and we jumped at the chance only because we had the support of IDASH and the interest and talent among the group here to help us do it because Chisato and I were not going to uh, tackle this. Um, and, and so the, the sequencing became available for free. It was donated, and, and that's how we got, obtained the sequence. I should also say that there was um, a seventh sequence done of an adult African-American individual uh, with bad uh, coronary disease uh, from Kawasaki disease who was unrelated, as far as anybody knows, to uh, our family. So we actually have seven sequences. And so uh, it, it began with getting the FASTQ file and Jihoon having to spend a lot of time with the engineers at uh, Illumina, just even getting the downloads of the FASTQ files, um, correcting errors, uh, lots of mistakes all over the place and going from the FASTQ to the BAM files. They tried to keep on giving us the BAM files, but there were so many errors that Jihoon really just had to start all over again at the beginning. 
and then um, working through this flow with, at the bottom, various kinds of filters uh, that we could apply. And I'm just going to show you one of the examples, because again, this is an iterative process where we keep on going back. And um, thank goodness for the um, iDash cloud, because uh, that was necessary to just handle all of these, these files and this iterative process of going back to the original data and then coming back down through that workflow, applying new kinds of filters uh, until we, we found things that, that we think are giving us answers that are interesting. So this is very much work in progress. Um, you can see starting off with uh, four to five million um, initial SNPs that are called and then working your way down by applying progressive filters where we um, made the variants uh, fit into various concepts about the family. So maybe we wanted both children who are affected to be homozygous for the rare allele, but no one else to be homozygous for that rare allele. The unaffected children could be homozygous for the uh, wild type allele, or they could be heterozygous. And we demanded that both parents be heterozygous, so it made genetic sense to us that the two affected children could be homozygous for the rare allele. So these kinds of um, filters were applied. And uh, initially, in the example you see here, we wanted these to be exonic SNPs. Well, I've already told you from the work that you just saw that the majority of the variants that we've discovered that absolutely influence both disease outcome as well as uh, susceptibility in Kawasaki disease are intronic, right? But if, you, if we apply the exonic filter uh, and we require that this be uh, an ex, uh, a change in the exon that would be predicted to have a high impact, uh, then we ended up with a very short list of genes. Um, and these are the SNPs uh, in, those, in those genes. And uh, this would be uh, the kind of file that uh, Jihoon produced for, uh, for each of these uh, variants. So you see the two affected children with the bright green there um, are both uh, uh, A's, uh, homozygous uh, for the A allele. Then you see that the uh, unaffected people are heterozygous. And the unaffected individual at the bottom is, again, homozygous for the A allele. So this would be one example of a variant. Now, this happens to be a gene about which there is one publication in Chinese, untranslated. And uh, it had something to do, as best I can tell, with uh, cancer and rearrangements and uh, that this gene was rearranged. Um, so unfortunately, that's all the information that we have about this gene. Um, the, Ji Hoon wanted to include this slide, so he gets some credit for the fact that uh, running through just one of these examples or iterations takes a week and three terabytes of storage per whole genome sample. And remember that we've got seven individuals. So this is not for the faint of heart, um, and it is certainly still a uh, work in progress. Uh, I, I should also mention, uh, Vineet didn't talk about it today. I wasn't sure if he was going to mention it. But uh, he's got a team of graduate students and has been a, a wonderful participant in looking at large-scale variations, structural variations, in these genomes as well. And uh, we're, we're slowly slogging through. Uh, but again, it's a steep learning curve. Uh, for all of us. So these are Ji Hoon's next steps. Uh, and uh, part, part of what uh, has been really interesting about the, the process of, of working with Ji Hoon is that he, at the same time that he's trying to understand how to create the pipeline and how to make this more automated and more um, uh, user friendly to, to march through this analysis. He's also trying to study Chisato and me and how we're thinking about what's interesting and what's not interesting and how we decide from all these possible variants what is interesting to us, what might have biologic relevance. And so um, we're, we're also the study subjects uh, in this research. And we, we hope, of course, at the end that we're going to be able to develop some guidelines, some tools, and some road roadmaps for others to follow. Uh, and that we're going to learn something interesting uh, about this rare disease. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to do some questions. They've heard about Kawasaki disease so many times, they're already experts now.
All right, thank you. Oh, no, it, there's a question. I'm sorry um, to slow things down, but there's, I was just barely hanging on with my fingernails and understanding what you were saying because I don't know the biology, you know, exonic and what, I don't know what these things are. But I think I get sort of the idea. And I think that I understood that you identified some SNPs that were relevant, that were significant, um, that none of which was a smoking gun. And I'm curious, because you have a small sample size and because therefore you would have sampling error, is it also possible that there are a whole bunch of other SNPs that are kind of equally significant? These are the ones that you found. Some of them are real. Some of them are not real because of the sampling error. But there are others that have sort of comparable significance that maybe you would find if you had a different similarly sized group, but radically different set of people, unrelated people. So, so I think you saw that by those arrows going down, the, each one of those arrows. So the red ar arrows are the new ones that we found by resequencing. So different methodology, uh, different cohort, okay? Mm -hmm. Those black arrows going down represented significant SNPs from a different other cohort right. and from other methodology. Okay. So it might be from a GWAS that we did with the big international collaboration. It might be from an association study that we did on a smaller cohort. It might be from a TDT analysis, the biologic parents and what choice did they make when they passed an allele to their affected right. child. So those were all different kinds of approaches that were used to generate those, and yes, you're absolutely right. You know, I think when I came to genetics initially, um, I just wanted someone to tell me, what's the right test to do? What's the right way that we should analyze these data? And the answer is you have to do it all. You have to do a GWAS, then you have to do a family linkage study, then you have to do sequencing. And every time you do one of those approaches, you're going to find new variants that you didn't find before. And I, I'm sure there's some mathematical understanding of why that is so, but it is so. And there's, there's no one single genetic approach in, a, in this kind of a disease, in, in a uh, uh, disease where it may be that, that having any one of those variants just tweaks that that uh, uh, transcription just a little bit so that you get a little bit more or a little bit less of that gene product. And when you do that, it a little bit increases or a little bit decreases your chance of a bad outcome or your chance of getting the disease in the first place. And so this is this world that we live in, that we live in, I live in, of complex genetics. It's not Mendelian, you know, easy, you have the mutation, you get the disease. It's not that kind of a, a situation. So you were absolutely right. So that suggests that you don't need exact accuracy in the things that you're measuring. If you're approximately right, then these things that are near threshold, some of them will show up, some of them won't. But it gives a lot more flexibility, which is appealing from the privacy aspect as, and also from the, uh, from the science side. So anyway. Or it introduces a lot more ambiguity. I'm not sure which. It's not clear. It's not clear. There seems to be a lot of ambiguity in the methods that are currently being used. So I don't know. OK, thank you. You're welcome. All right. And now Ji Hoon. <laughs> 